This is Devin Foley, and I am the CEO of the Charlemagne Institute, and this is our third episode of Back Channel. We have with us today Dr. Paul Godfrey, the editor-in-chief of Chronicles Magazine, which is published by the Charlemagne Institute, and he is here to discuss uh, the question of what is fascism? Because uh, no doubt, if you like to talk about politics, like to talk about political philosophy or theory, uh, or if you're just a normal American and think America's great, you've probably been called a fascist by now at least once or twice. And the term is getting thrown around. It's uh, being used to smear anybody and everybody and uh, we decided to reach out to one of the foremost authorities on fascism and its historical roots and how it's played out and that would be dr paul godfried and uh, we are live streaming today to the chronicles facebook page the intellectual takeout facebook page as well as to the charlemagne institute uh, youtube channel for all of those, uh, Dr. Gottfried will be doing his presentation, and then we'll be taking questions uh, for most of the program after that. If you have questions, please post them to either Facebook or YouTube, or you can also email us at contact at charlemagneinstitute.org. Again, that's contact at charlemagneinstitute.org. And uh, we will do our best. I will do our, my best to work those questions into the program. And if you are not a subscriber yet of Chronicles Magazine, please consider doing so. Go to chroniclesmagazine.org and for $5 a month, uh, you can read Dr. Gottfried as well as a host of other fantastic authors. And of course, visit Intellectual Takeout too, where uh, Dr. Gottfried shows up in his writing as well as other authors there as well. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Paul Gottfried. Dr. Gottfried, what is fascism? That, that's a, a very, very difficult question. I can tell you what fascism is not. Uh, and I wrote an entire book on anti-fascism, uh, which is uh, uh, mostly a critique of people who wrongly ascribe fascism to those they don't like uh, or those with whom they have political disagreement. Um, recently, I contributed an essay to a, a, an anthology published by Rutledge, uh, which dealt with the question, is Trump a fascist? Uh, there are 25 essays in that book. Mine is the only one that argues that Trump is not a fascist. Uh, and having looked at the other 24 essays, I think these people are living on the moon. Uh, they have absolutely, I think what they're saying is that they are politically on the left, the cultural social left, and they don't like Trump because he does not represent their, their program, uh, which hardly proves that he's a fascist. Um, I also heard Trump say that the people on the other side who are destroying cities uh, are fascist. Um, I'm not sure that President Trump knows what the word fascist is any, any more than the people who are attacking him um, as a fascist. It, it is an overused term. And um, uh, what I do in my book, Fascism, The Career of a Concept, this book right here, <clears throat> um, is try to uh, explain what fascism is and what fascism is not. Uh, and my treatment is largely historical. Um, I see fascism as an interwar European movement, which is a reaction to the revolutionary left. Um, I do not see that. Uh, uh, I also distinguish between something like Nazism, uh, which is a totally destructive, in, an international destructive movement, uh, which exterminates a lot of people and is characterized by a brutal totalitarian government and what I call generic fascists. The generic fascists, uh, such as the Italian fascists or some of their French or Spanish counterparts, um, are largely a Latin authoritarian movement that develops in the interwar period. Um, what I argue is it really doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, it typically develops in second world countries that are just beginning to industrialize. Their reaction to, uh, to social strife um, and they build on a certain tradition of nationalism, what they call revolutionary nationalism, um, and tip quite typically on a certain kind of Latin Catholic culture. Um, if you notice, they all speak about a corporate economy that clearly is taken from the uh, uh, from the uh, the pontifical pronouncements of Leo the Thirteenth, 
uh, and they go back to uh, scholasticism, neo-scholasticism. They have some kind of Aristotelian or Thomist basis, although when you put this into practice with the fascist movement, it's mostly window dressing. You know, they, they do not capture the essence of Thomism uh, with their fascist hierarchy. Uh, but uh, in, in some ways, they're trying to return to a conservatism, a European conservatism that is pretty much um, disintegrating by the time the fascists come around. And what they're doing is trying to restore hierarchy, uh, restore order uh, that seems to be uh, seems to be going away. It seems to be vanishing and being replaced by chaos. Um, the, the Italian fascists, who are the only fascists who actually take over a government and uh, manage uh, to hold on to that government all the way down to 1943. Um, uh, they take over in, in, in October of, of 1922, and they take over legally because Mussolini, who is the head of what is called the Fasci Italiani di Combattimento, the fascist, uh, the Italian f- fascist of combat, <laughs> uh, literally, um, uh, he uh, is selected to be the, the premier of Italy by the king. He's appointed to that position. Uh, and there are people sitting in the Italian parliament who represent a fascist party, a partito fascista. And this exists, you know, uh, from 1919, they become a party. They're putting up candidates. Uh, they also um, are organizing street uh, fighters uh, to oppose the leftist street fighters. And this, of course, sort of recalls what is, uh, should or, or should make us think of what's now going on in the United States, where the left is taking over cities, shooting people of all races, tearing down statues, burning buildings. Uh, and there really is very little uh, pushback, if you notice. Um, you have to remember that in Italy, in you know, 1919, 1920, there was a much larger right. Uh, there was a larger, more active right than what exists in the United States or most Western democracies today. Um, and they did not want the social revolutionaries taking over particularly since they began occupying factories in northern, in northern Italian cities. Um, and the, the fascists are going to fight them for control of these cities um, and are largely successful because they have the larger, uh, I suppose, clubs or whatever they're fighting with. Um, and they manage to impose their will. <laughs> this is basically the way Mussolini and the other early fascists like Farinacci and others see this it's a matter of imposing will. By the way, one of the best biographies in any language of Mussolini is by a Chronicles contributor, Nick Farrell, uh, whose biography of Mussolini, I think, is the best one in the English language, one of the best biographies of Mussolini ever written. And he, he really does show the way he takes power um, and the... Um, uh, the struggle for control of Italian cities after the First World War. Most of the fascists who are fighting are World War I veterans. And uh, there are different groups of veterans who are going to be fighting, some with the fascists. Uh, but these are the most successful because they have the strongest and the most willful leader. Um, and Mussolini is, in his own right, a political genius. Uh, and he is able to impose it. The, the, the movement is at least in theory a quasi-socialist movement until Mussolini takes power. Then it allies itself more and more with um, the uh, the captains of industry uh, in Italy um, and becomes a movement largely based in the middle class because it has support from both the lower middle class and the upper middle class, both of which feel threatened by these riots. Uh, so that's how the fascist movement goes. But it also creates a model for fascist movements in other countries. Um, And they spring up all over Europe in the interwar period. And they're typically movement, nationalist movements that are directed against the revolutionary left. And they're all anti-communist. And particularly after you have a communist revolution in Russia and the creation of a common turn to spread uh, uh, Soviet revolution, uh, the fascist movements that develop um, are generally viewed by the middle class as a counterforce. Very interesting as far as it starts. Caleb is curious, you know, when these discussions about fascism are taking place, is fascism uh, when corporations run the government? 
uh, is that uh, we often hear that thrown around. Is that accurate that the, you know, t one of the marks of a fascist state would be the corporations running the government, as it were? No. Um, what fascist government, at least certainly when you look at fascist Italy does, is they uh, try to integrate the captains of industry. In Italy, they're called a confindustria, um, or the, the, uh, there's a confederation of industrialists, a confederazione di industriali, and they pull these people into an alliance with the fascist government. Um, but the, the, the basis of fascist power is very much in the middle class. Uh, it is largely a middle class movement, uh, and it's a reaction against the revolutionary left, which appeals to patriotic symbols um, into a patriotic fervor that was created by Italian participation in World War I. Um, there, there is a very um, important book written by a former teacher of mine, Henry Ashby Turner, on you know the question of was Hitler a tool of German industrialists? Now that's a, a, Hitler, the Nazi movement. I treat separately from generic fascism. I think it's much more vicious and totalitarian, much more destructive. Um, but we know that Hitler, Hitler was not a tool of industrialists. A, Italian, a German industrialists typically supported non non Nazi parties. They were terrified of the Nazis. They thought the Nazis would pull them back into a war. Um, and would also socialize the economy because for a long time the Nazis said they were socialists or national socialists. Um, so I, I think the, the view that somehow corporations um, are the major force within fascism is simply wrong. Fascinating. Now, what about the issue of race? Uh, is, is, a, is any mark of nationalism uh, the mark of a, of a fascist? So, for instance, in America, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of Americans desire to limit uh, immigration or halt immigration right now. Is that fascism on its own simply because a nation or a state decides that it wants to limit uh, immigration? My answer is absolutely. There's absolutely no connection between between the two, <laughs> and I've written copiously on the subject. Um, uh, you know, opposition to immigration can come from just about anywhere. Uh, uh, the 1924 Immigration Act enjoyed the support of the American Federation of Labor. Uh, typically, communist parties opposed uh, immigration because they hurt the indigenous workforce. Um, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the Nazis, you can't say were anti-immigration. They wanted to conquer everything. They want to occupy other countries. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the question also comes up, you know, were fascists necessarily racialist or anti-Semites? And my answer is in some cases they were, in some cases they were not at all. I mean, I, I do not find either anti-Semitism or racialism in the Falange uh, in Spain, which is, you know, it has a heavy Catholic character uh, and it's, it's anti-communist, was led by uh, Primo de Rivera. Uh, they don't even talk about this. In fact, they were, uh, Prima de Rivera said as a Catholic, he was very uh, contemptuous of German racism. You know, I mean, so you, you get people, uh, Mussolini is not a racist at all. I mean, it was a large part of the Italian fascist movement that up until 1938 was Jewish. Uh, some of the uh, the senators or the uh, sitting in this sort of the, uh, uh, the pseudo <laughs> legislature that the fascists create are Jewish. Um, however, after 1938, Mussolini starts to imitate Hitler's anti-Semitism. He passes anti-Jewish laws. Um, but this is certainly not uh, intrinsic to Italian fascism or to Spanish fascism. Uh, in, in France, you get this in some fascist movements, but not in others. Um, it is certainly much more characteristic of the German Nazis. Um, there is one fascist movement which is clearly anti-Semitic. In fact, it's part of the foundation foundational belief, the, uh, the Iron Guard in Romania, which, which tries to play on the Latin roots of the Romanians. You know, they see themselves as descended from the Romans, although they're mixed with all kinds of other people, and they even Latinize their language. Um, uh, and they are great admirers of Mussolini. They're also fanatically anti-Semitic. Um, so, I mean, you do get this sort of fusion 
of of uh, of movements and forces uh, sometimes in the fascist movement. But there's nothing in you know in 1936 there was a famous meeting of the fascist in Montreux uh, in um, in France. I think it was France, not Switzerland. Uh, and it was it was internet. The Muslim was trying to think an fascist international, and the Iron Guard brought up that question of is an anti-Semitism basic to fascism? Uh, and all these fascists looked at him like you had, a, you had an Irish fascist, the blues or what they're called. And they didn't know what he's talking about. I mean, they had no interest in this particular subject. <laughs> they were doing a, they just wanted to drive out the British or fight the British. Um, uh, you even had uh, uh, Zionist followers of Italian fascism. You had uh, uh, back to Africa followers of Mussolini until he invaded Ethiopia in 1936. So fascism was an extremely pervasive movement in the interwar period. Um, and to try to reduce it to something like anti-Semitism, uh, you know, unless you're looking at Nazi Germany or the Iron Guard is, is probably a mistake. <clears throat> Fascinating. Now, uh, for those who are watching, we're starting to get lots of good questions coming in. Again, if you have questions uh, for Dr. Gottfried, please post those either to Facebook or to YouTube, or you can also email us at contact at charlemagneinstitute.org. Uh, now, Dr. Gottfried, we, you know, a lot of people have heard that the difference between socialism and fascism has much to do with uh, ownership of the means of production, that, you know, the socialists, uh, there is no private property, that the state, as represented by the proletariat, all of that, uh, owns the means of production, whereas in a fascist state, the you are still allowed to have private property and corporations and businesses, mm -hmm. but that the state dictates how those are to be used. Uh, would that be an accurate uh, distinction between socialism and fascism? Yes, it is. No, I think you're right. Um, uh, if you sort of look at the economics of Italian fascism, they don't, they really don't, doesn't look very different from what FDR did in the United States. There's very little difference. Uh, it's sort of like pump priming, spending on social programs, public works. It's pretty much the same. Um, uh, and also paying um, paying subsidies. <laughs> this is uh, uh, something that FDR may have borrowed from Italian fascism because, because there is almost a kind of symbiotic relationship. And people in the New Deal were great admirers of Italian fascism. Uh, they moved away from it in 1936 uh, when Mussolini... Um, joins Hitler in the Axis. But, uh, but up until then, there, you know, there, there is um, uh, a willingness on the part of new, of new dealers and people in the brain trust, brain trusters of FDR to learn from the Italian fascists. Uh, and the fascists run pretty much what looks like, you know, a typical interwar welfare state. Uh, on that, you know, a follow-up question for you then is, how was Italian fascism perceived, uh, let's say, in the later 1920s and uh, early to mid-1930s? Yeah, that is an excellent question, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> it's one to which I devote, I think, several chapters of my book. <laughs> what is the public perception of fascism? Uh, and it might interest you to know that most of the public think that they're great. Do you remember the Cole Porter um, uh, uh, thing is that you're the tops, you're Mussolini, uh, in one of the songs, and then he has to change it later on during the war or something. Uh, uh, Mussolini was extremely popular. He was sort of like a, like a rock star um, everywhere. You know, they'd invite him to mediate between people, group, groups that were fighting. Uh, and his popularity went right across the political spectrum. There were some socialists um, who got kicked out by him or saw him as, you know, an oppressor. Um, and they land up going to Paris. Some land up in New York. But they're not very influential. And uh, nobody quite knows. Where. There's a liberal opposition. Uh, there is a Catholic opposition. Uh, basically, you have the same person, Luigi Sturzo, who's a priest who opposes him for about 25 years and then lands up with a sister in Brooklyn, you know, still denouncing Mussolini. <laughs> uh, but, but most people don't particularly care uh, about, you know, the fact that he has an authoritarian regime at home. 
Um, he's seen as creating a very good welfare state, making the trains run on time, which in fact he did not. Uh, and he has, you know, very good PR. Uh, he also has extremely nice art. Uh, he's a patron of the arts. Uh, people like Puccini, Art Arturo Toscanini were great admirers of Mussolini. Um, uh, he um, pioneers all kinds of artistic styles. Um, he's a kind of a st Salvador Dali was a great fan of, of Mussolini. He had fans all over the place. Um, and fashion is really seen as the movement of the future, uh, the movimento del futuro, the movement of the future. And this is how they advertise. You know, they, they put up in Chicago uh, this, this monument to Balbo, who was the uh, Italian fascist leader who flew all around, flew from, uh, what did he fly? I think from Rome to Chicago or something. And uh, he was a great hero. Um, and it's only recently that they tried to remove his monument. Um, uh, the, fasc the fascist movement also was very popular among Italian Americans, not because they were, you know, right wing extremists, but because, you know, here was a leader back home in the old country that everybody admires. You know, he's a man of the future. He was honored everywhere. Um, and uh, I, I, I think he only uh, it does uh, destroys himself by aligning with Hitler in 1936. He could, he could have, if, if, between 1934 and 1936, he also was the head of the anti-Nazi front in Europe, the Strasser front, which, which prevents Hitler from seizing Austria. He sends an army up there. Uh, he's allied to the English, to the French and others, you know, in a kind of anti-Nazi front. So they did not see this unity, you know, of Nazis and fascists at the time. The fascists were seen as the good guys. Um, the, other, the other thing he does, which I think sort of realigns him, um, is supporting the nationalist side in Spain, um, which clearly shows he's coming out on the side of the right, right? Because it's a right-left war. <laughs> so uh, up until then, I mean, the fascists could be on the left and the right. The New Republic thought they were great. The New Republic was pro was pro Soviet and pro uh, pro Mussolini at the same time. Um, a lot of people were uh, were pro Mussolini and pro Soviet. Uh, in the 1920s, it's, it was common that you found people, you know, admired both. These were great, you know, great. These are leaders of the future, Lenin and, and Mussolini. Fascinating. Now, uh, we've got a question coming in from Intellectual Takeout from Benjamin. Mm -hmm. uh, he is wondering actually more so, uh, is fascism when people use power to suppress your free will? Is that the mark of fascism? Uh, and I might add, it, or is that the mark of a totalitarian? Is there a distinction? Oh, I think there is. I don't think the Italian fascists are totalitarians. They have an authoritarian regime that becomes nasty by the late 30s. They, in 1943, uh, Mussolini is dismissed from power and put in jail by the king. <laughs> uh, they still have a monarchy. Uh, and they still have an assembly. <laughs> Uh, it's the fascist assembly also which votes to kick him out. Um, and then the Germans come and put him back in power. And you basically have the, you know, the Nazis and the Waffen SS <laughs> running Italy until the Americans uh, move up the boot and then kick them out. Um, but uh, the fascist movement for about 20 years is, is certainly not a, not a totalitarian movement. It is, it is an authoritarian state, which has sort of a new look, a kind of revolutionary nationalist look. Um, totalitarian states are exactly what he describes. They are states in which there is no opposition. It is, well, to use our contemporary term, totalitarian states are total cancel cultures. There is no opposition permitted. And this is what the left is trying to do right now, create a, create a totalitarian state. They're doing exactly what Stalin and Hitler did. It's exactly the same. Um, and uh, it is much worse than Italian fascism, you know, which I think which I think is an historical curiosity for the most part. Uh, it's an interesting movement, but, you know, I, I don't think it really has legs. Uh, totalitarian regimes are very dangerous and they're characteristic um, of a certain loss of freedom uh, and a centralization of power in the 20 and 21st centuries. And we had to be we had to be very careful about that. Um, and I think it can work here or in Western Europe much, much more than in China, because China is just too big. We have a billion and a half people there and they're spread over. Um, uh, here we have very, very centralized communication, centralized states, centralized 
education. And we have popular culture, which seems to be entirely taken over by the totalitarian left. So I, I think I think we face a danger uh, that did not exist in Italian fascism in the 1920s. That's very interesting. Now, we're getting a question from Jesse. He's inquiring if you've read Umberto Eco's uh, 1995 New York Review of Books essay on Ur fascism. Uh, he says it seems to condemn any sort of rightist thought as fascist. What would you say to that? I think it's very tendentious. I know I do not agree with Umberto Eco, who's a great Italian novelist, by the way. Um, but uh, you know, he has a typical totalitarian leftist mindset. Anyone, another one is Zev Sternhell, who was uh, an Israeli who wrote in French. He's one of the best historians of fascism, but Sternhell, like Echo, has a totally closed mind uh, that if you disagree with me, you're a fascist. Um, I think the right is an essential part of the political spectrum. Um, I know I'm on the right, but I don't claim to have a monopoly on truth. You know, I think there has to be a dialectic, there has to be an open discussion. Uh, and I'm certainly willing to listen to people who disagree with me, although they may not share my worldview. Um, uh, for somebody like Echo, the, for Echo, there's only an echo chamber. I can play on that <laughs> term. And no, I do not agree with him at all. I think what he says is extremely dangerous and right now is leading in a totalitarian direction. What would you say, you know, as far as this, you've you've spoken about the sort of totalitarian uh, traits of the left and what would arguably be uh, Antifa, uh, most I mean, obvious, you know, visible to everyone. Mm -hmm. Question about that from Francis is, uh, you know, when you look at Antifa, do you see any prospects for it to become a true political movement as opposed to what seems to me uh, this is from Francis, pretty much street violence against perceived rightists. You know, the, the introductory chapter to my book on anti-fascism deals precisely with that subject. Can Antifa become a political? My answer is yes. Or that they can become, it can become major players in, a left, in creating a leftist totalitarian society. Now, obviously, they cannot take power on their own because all they can do is shoot people and blow up buildings and uh, create and, and wreak havoc. Uh, but what they are doing is providing the groundwork for a totalitarian state. Um, unless they are resisted, everything is lost. Okay, so um, uh, in a piece in Chronicles, I compare them to the brown shirts uh, whom Hitler finally had to get rid of in June of 1934 because they were, they were just too violent. <laughs> Even for the Nazis, they were too violent. <laughs> Uh, and this is my this is my impression of Antifa. So I think they are very dangerous. They're they're not going to be on their own a a, a party, but you know you're going to get Michelle Obama and others apologizing for them uh, in trying to carry out their agenda. And if you notice now, I mean the Democratic Party is not serious about opposing any of these people. I mean occasionally they say yeah it's bad and it's all Trump's fault. Uh, they they are not going to oppose this. Um, I don't much trust the Republican Party either to do much. Um, I, I don't really blame the Republican. It seems that, you know, the people have been so indoctrinated by the leftist media and public education uh, that, you know, things that may be obvious to us are not obvious to the to the general mass of people. I mean, they uh, uh, I was I was just reading something about, you know, the pop, pop, popular opinion or public opinion in New York City. Uh, about half the population supports what's going on and think the police are bad people because they're trying to stop this. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a scary situation. Uh, when I handed in my book on anti-fascism, something like 60% of the people had a positive view of Black Lives Matter, which is also engaging in violence. So, uh, you know, there, there is a real problem turning things around that did not exist in fascist Italy in 1921, you know, I mean, uh, before the pre-fascist Italy. There they were angry that the government didn't take, didn't take strong measures, you know, and that's why the fascists took over. Here it's just, you know, people are willing to accept these things, you know, and they think they have a just cause and, they, you know, they're, they're burning down cities. Probably these cities are full of sexist or racist or homophobes, whatever they say. And, uh, you know, we have a very difficult job 
um, of you know educating the other half of the population uh, that what is happening could have a very very bad outcome. Can you speak to the rise of Franco and what took place in Spain uh, during the Spanish Civil War and whether or not that there are similarities to what we are facing and just as a as an add-on to that what was life like under franco yeah there, there by the way there is no single franco regime because there are different phases of his regime he doesn't die until the mid-1970s and he takes power you know by january of 1939 um and at least the early years of the Franco regime, uh, he does very little to improve the economic or social situation and tries to play off the, uh, the allies against the Axis power to get back Gibraltar and parts of North Africa. Uh, then after the Second World War, he sort of liberalizes his regime. Um, and the last phase of his government pretty much leads into the post-Franco government. This is not unusual because, you know, in the 19th century of someone like Louis Napoleon in France, who also has a kind of military government that he puts in place uh, after the revolution of 1848. And that sort of moves by phases into a more and more liberal kind of government by 1870. Um, uh, Franco takes power um, uh, as a result of a number of accidents. Uh, there is a nationalist uprising against a left-wing Spanish government, uh, which is, I think, sometimes mistakenly identified as a republic. It was not. It was utter chaos uh, by, by July of, of 1936, because the leftist parties that were controlling the government were engaging in mass violence, uh, like burning, like blowing up churches, shooting priests and nuns. And those are some of their nicer acts. I mean, they just went crazy. Um, uh, committing mayhem and murder all over the country. And there probably was, you know, a plan by the right at some point, you know, not to let this go. The, the last uh, so-called democratic election uh, that brought the left to power um, in 1935 uh, was, a, from what we can tell, was a totally fraudulent election. Uh, like the one that may take place in November here, <laughs> you know, with, with the mail-in ballots and all kinds of other stuff back in the 30s. Uh, but they did not behave well. Uh, also, you have to remember that Spain was a profoundly conservative country in 1936. The Catholic Church was ultra-conservative. Uh, you, had, you had a landowning class that was very conservative, and most of the bourgeoisie was very conservative. Um, so that uh, when the nationalists planned this military uprising in July of 1936, they had a lot of people behind them. Now, the Republic might have been able to save itself, uh, but it fought the war so badly on its side uh, and could not control the anarchists who went around committing acts of violence. Um, uh, although, although uh, as a result of some of Franco's vindictive acts after the war, the nationalist side lands up killing slightly more people than the Republican side. The Republican side kills all these people at the beginning. That's why you get you get the uprising. They're engaging in mass murder. Uh, so you get you get a, you get an uprising, um, and uh, much of the military, the air force, and I think the navy stay with the Republic. Uh, the army is divided, um, and uh, Franco sort of low, low sort of he's he's involved in this as a general, but he is not the man who was put in charge with San Jorge, who dies in a plane crash by by a series of lucky or unlucky accidents. Franco is left um, running the national side. Uh, he was not particularly far on the right. People are sometimes uh, surprised to hear this. He was at best a uh, sort of a kind of uh, occasional Catholic, although he supports Catholic privilege once he gets into power and even bans the practice of the Protestant religion in Spain. Um, he, is, uh, he is not a monarchist. He swears allegiance to the lay constitution of the Republic. Uh, he's, he's a Republican. Uh, but the war itself puts him in this right wing position because the Republic was running around blowing up churches and shooting priests, right? Uh, and also killing off people who were members of the Christian Democratic Party in Spain who were Catholic. 
So he lands up, he lands up becoming the, the champion of the Catholic Church uh, and a monarchist, which he had not been to start with. Um, and it's basically a coalition that you have that are fighting the war. The Carlists are on the right, the Calistas, uh, who do not support Alfonso, the monarch, or his son. They support the Carlist candidate going back to the 1830s. There's a division. And the Carlists are also ultra-Catholic. Um, they, uh, uh, they are en enemies of modernity. Uh, uh, they think the Inquisition was probably a good thing. Uh, they're sort of very eccentric right wingers uh, who are Carlist. They do not let. They do a lot of fighting, but they get no power <laughs> at the end of the war. Um, the uh, uh, you also get the regular monarchists who are on Franco's side. The Catholic Church has no choice but to back Franco, since the other side planned to wipe them out. Um, and uh, much of the bourgeoisie, the the sort of the urban middle class. Um, are on the side of the um, uh, are on the side of the of the nationalist. Uh, most of the, the uh, much of the support that goes to the republic, and this is sort of interesting, is regional support. Like they're very strong in Catalonia uh, because these are separatists. They're Catalan separatists. They also have lots of support in the Basque country, which is very conservative Catholic. And also produces a lot of the forces that go that support the nationalists, but the the Basques are separatists. <laughs> they're very Catholic and they're very separatist, and they want their fuerzas, their regional rights. They're anti-nationalist. They're sort of like the Confederates. They want to go their own way. <laughs> and uh, Franco lands up, you know, wiping a lot of them out. And these are conservatives, but they 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 make an alliance with the Republic uh, because they want they want separatism. They're, fi they're fighting. They're fighting to uh, uh, to achieve uh, regional independence. Uh, you also get a lot of support for the republic um, coming from the Communist Party. In fact, the Communist Party lands up taking over the Republican side, and the Soviets start sending in an international force made up entirely, almost entirely, of communists. Uh, there are other international forces that are Marxist but do not accept the Soviet line, and they land, you know, and the Soviets. The, the ones the Soviets send and kill off the other ones before Franco does. So uh, the Republican side is made up largely of international brigades, you know, as the war progresses. And then you have the regionalist um, and uh, the socialist and the far left, you know, unions, working class unions um, will uh, will generally support the Republican side. Um, but I, they, they, I think it is their war to lose. and They manage to lose it. It's maybe, you know, it might happen to Biden, this election. I mean, it's like, you know, they, they start out in a strong position. Uh, they control part of the army. They control the Navy, the Air Force. And they can always claim to be the legitimate government, although I would think, you know, they forfeit that. Stanley Payne, by the way, is the best American historian writing on the Civil War. He's actually the best writer on the subject in any country. And he was on a sort of got me interested in this. Payne has also written some very good books on fascism. And he did a biography of Franco. He does not like Franco. He thinks Franco behaves in a very in a very cruel fashion once he wins. But it's very clear that he thinks, you know, the nationalists were much less dangerous than the other side uh, and that the republic would have been far more vicious if they had won. Um, and the nationalists, out of the nationalist victory, he argues, eventually comes some kind of decent regime. The republic would have been incapable of controlling its own violence. Um, another group that plays an absolutely um, devastating role in this are the Spanish anarchists, who are responsible for a lot of the spontaneous violence that um, in 1936 will cause the, uh, the nationalist uprising to take place. <clears throat> um, by the way, the nationalists also are, come with a North African brigade. Um, they, they bring with them uh, Muslim Moroccan troops. Because uh, Franco was in charge of ruling over Spanish Morocco. <laughs> so Yolanda's are bringing Muslims, you know, to fight the war. And the Republic tried to play on this for a while that, you know, he was using a Muslim force in, in a Catholic country. But it didn't work very well since the Republican side was so busy ki killing off Catholics that, you know, that was not a very convincing argument. Um, but the, the nationalists did not have a particularly strong hand. 
And if you look at the map of Spain, there are certain areas where they just win, you know, um, almost at once the uprising. Everybody joins them. Uh, Up in the north, part of the northeastern part of Spain, uh, Old Castile, they do well there. And then some parts of the south, uh, uh, I think even in Andalusia, they're doing okay. Uh, The rest of the country actually remains in Republican hands. They have to fight for several years in order to gain control of the entire country. Um, And it is really not until um, the beginning of 1939, until March of 1939, that they control both Barcelona and Madrid. Fascinating. The the parallels, possible parallels, are uh, for what we're experiencing right now with rampant violence and seemingly uncontrolled violence by the left are uh, chilling, to say the least. Uh, John on YouTube asks, and this is, I guess, related to that and what you were, what you elaborated on there is, what in your opinion would be a tipping point moving the USA from uh, what he would say, John says, as a democracy to a, quote, less citizen centric form of government? Uh, So in other words, uh, is there a point that you are concerned by that this the violence that we're seeing in cities and in states and areas and that it becomes so out of control that a more authoritarian uh, regime is necessary. Yeah, I think the United States might be fortunate to get an authoritarian regime. What I'm afraid of is what has been called anarcho tyranny, uh, that you'll have violence going on and, you know, you'll have people like uh uh, Governor Whitmer or the uh, the people running Minnesota <laughs> or Keith Ellison at the top, <laughs> Kamala Harris, <clears throat> and they'll basically be beating up sort of on a white middle class Christian population. I mean, that's what I would expect them them to do. Um, but, you know, the riots would go on and just like with the lockdowns, it doesn't apply to people making, you know, left wing riots. Uh, the same thing is true in, in, in Germany and other countries. So I I think this might be, you know, the outcome if the Democrats win in November. Uh, I think we're that close. I I mean, I'm not not sure that, you know, I view America as a democracy. It's a constitutional republic. And I think it has become less and less of one throughout my lifetime. And I was born in November of 1941. I think things just get are just getting worse and worse um, in terms of the political regime in the United States. And, you know, I, I think we were ceasing to be what the founders wanted politically even earlier. Now, I know the other arguments that certain people were not allowed to vote or women didn't vote or other people didn't vote. I know this is true, um, but you can extend the franchise to a point that, you know, the people who are voting do not want con- constitutional republic anymore. They want social programs. They want an activist state, you know, giving them compensatory justice or over. Uh, 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 forcing the rest of us to grant some form of equality. So I, I think in order to have a constitutional republic, uh, you must have an electorate who wants to preserve that form of government. Uh, and I don't think there are many in the United States who want to preserve that form of government, maybe outside the Charlemagne Institute uh, and a few other <laughs> institutes. Uh, so that, that to me is a serious problem. You know, there, there has to be a commitment to limited government there has to be a commitment to um, uh, to allowing people to do things we don't necessarily agree with, but which to, to which they have a constitutional right. They're allowed to express views we don't agree with, right? Or which are, which which the media might consider insensitive. That is their constitutional right. Um, they do not have a they say they have a constitutional right to say what the media allows them to say is ridiculous. I mean, they're they're they're, sim- they're simply saying what people in power want them to say to accommodate them. Freedom only comes into play uh, if you want to dissent. Fascinating. The you know, John has a follow-up question, actually, which I think is a good one. How do you balance your knowledge of what's taking place uh, currently, and then lining that up with history and the examples of the past? How do you balance that knowledge and understanding with activism? In the sense, is there, do you feel an obligation to affect change? And if so, 
if there are others out there too, how do you go about affecting change in this climate and environment? Right. <clears throat> you know, I, I know that this is strange for an historian to say, and for, for somebody who looks at the past always in historical context, but I, I, I'm not so sure that the past um, has that much to teach us in the present situation. Um, out, outside of the obvious fact that living in a free constitutional regime is a precarious condition, it's very, it's very hard to keep that. Um, <clears throat> that guy, but although what destroys it will, will sort of differ from time to time. Uh, what, one of the things that I, I find is, an abs- is, is something that has become an absolutely poisonous obsession uh, in the modern period is equality, uh, which, you know, I could say is sort of good within a very limited uh, sense, like, you know, we want to give people uh, equal access to the law in America or something like that. That's fine. Uh, but you could absolutely, you can never achieve perfect equality. Uh, and it, it's foolish to try. Uh, in societies that function have always been built on hierarchy, right? Men have had different roles from women. Uh, citizens have different roles from non-citizens, right? Um, and if you want to preserve constitutional government, you have to be careful who votes. You have to restrict the electorate, you know, to people who have a commitment to preserving that form of government, um, who aren't necessarily people on the other end of the mail-in ballot. Uh, and, uh, you know, the left is right in wanting to let everybody come in and giving them Vincent voting right because they want to seize power. That's the way you do it. And the left has seized power by extending the franchise. So um, I, I, I think there is there is danger to things like universal uh, universal suffrage. Uh, if you want to preserve constitutional freedom um, and the kind of constitution that the American founders set up. So that, that, that's something that I think one can learn from looking at history. At the same time, one has to recognize differences. <clears throat> and the problems that we face are not the same as the ones faced by Italy in 1922 or Spain in 1936. Um, one difference is that the forces of resistance are much weaker now. Uh, and th- this is a problem we're going to have to deal with. People say, you know, well, gee, why is there no pushback? Um, and the answer is people are afraid to push back. And most people have been indoctrinated by the left for a very long time, since the 1960s, at least. In the 1950s, things were better. But since the, I think since the 1960s, I mean, I've seen the left taking power over all institutions in this society and throughout the West. It's because it's the same in France and Germany as it is here. There's no Holland. There's no difference. England is the same. Canada's worse. Uh, and you sort of look at these places and it's the same kind of left that it, and it's, they're not necessarily the Marxist left. They're into this uh, women's rights, open borders, multiculturalism, LGBT. We can call the cultural Marxist left. left. These people have been taking power for a very long time. Uh, and the question we have to ask is, you know, who is out there that is going to fight them or oppose them? Uh, and uh you know, if we have 40 percent of the population right now, we're fortunate. So I, I don't I don't think we, we are in exactly the same situation that French uh, or Italians or Spaniards were in the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, we have a much worse hand. The a good follow up question to that comes from David uh, on our Chronicles Facebook page. Uh, he asked, do you think regionalization will increase in the United States in the near future? Uh, you're nodding your head uh, <laughs> quite a bit there. So uh, I'm nodding my head to say I, I hope he's right. <laughs> you know? okay. Well, I, and then I guess his follow-up question is: Under what circumstances would regionalization not increase? Well, the problem is we have a highly centralized government, um, and we have centralized media, centralized public education. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, and we have very large cities with the majority of the population. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, you know, will they tolerate regions? Will they allow them to exist? I mean, how, how, another thing is how exactly will this work? Um, if the people from the cities, you know, push into the suburbs and then come to my small town, uh, who is going to resist them? 
uh, if the federal government wants to impose political correctness on everybody in my town, how, I mean, what do we do? Uh, so, you know, regionalism is fine in theory. I'm just not sure that we have, you know, the power to make it work. Fascinating. Well, on that, I guess, do you think there's a good chance of following if regionalism uh, takes root and uh, the ability to have power within those regions increases? Is there a chance that there's a breakup of the U.S. in the near future, or does the centralized state hold things together? Well, you're not going to get rid of the centralized state. They will necessarily hold things together, but not in a way we would, that, that either one of us would want. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the problem is the regionalists don't hold a very good hand. I'm, I'm on their side, but, you know, what is our hand? I mean, uh, uh, you could say that in 1861, when the Confederacy was formed, these, these were all contiguous states, right? And they shared many of the same values. Um, now we have our you know, dispersed regions, uh, and they're not even all culturally and socially the same. The town in which I live, I suspect, will vote about 90% for Trump, but we have 10% who are, you know, screening leftists, and they're running around saying they're going to boycott people who have Trump signs in front of them. I mean, it's, and, you know, it, it, strangely enough, the, the, the majority is scared of these geriatric leftists. Uh, what bothers me is there is no pushback. Um, I'm not saying we have to engage in violence. What I'm saying is, you know, where are the people who boycott um, uh, Pepsi, uh, PepsiCo because it supports Antifa? Uh, where are the people who say, no, I'm not going to give my money to the NBA because they're supporting violence? Um, you know, I mean, th th there's nothing. I mean, nobody seems to be pushing back on the right uh, except, you know, except for, for quietly telling you they're going to vote for Donald Trump. So it seems it seems that the left has much more wind in its sails. Uh, not only do they control all the vital institutions of our society, but they also uh, uh, seem to be much more committed to taking action. Fascinating <laughs> and disturbing. Uh, a, stepping back a little bit from that discussion, uh, Mike has a question about the role of sort of decadence and artistic decadence and mm -hmm. how that plays into, uh, you know, desires for fascism or authoritarianism, things of that nature. Could you touch upon that? Yeah, I, I, I think that we generally assume that all fascists are against decadence in art, right? I mean, they, because it does not represent the vitality of the historic nation or something like that. Um, that is not really true. Um, one of the, uh, the major sources of Mussolini's popularity was he was a great artistic innovator in the 1920s. Um, a lot of, you know, you look at fascist iconography, it's fascinating. The architecture is fascinating. And they do see themselves as innovators. The Nazis are sort of, you know, of two minds about this. They try to bring back something that looks like... Uh, Roman imperial architecture, probably imitating the Italian fascists who are doing this. Um, but they also have these collections in German, uh, uh, in German you'd say, Sammlungen der Entartete des Verkunst, collections of degenerate art. <laughs> That's the term Entartung in German, and degeneracy. Uh, so these, this is bad art. Then you discover a lot of it's just done by Jews, whom he doesn't like. So this is what makes it bad. He also doesn't like abstract expressionism, nor, nor did uh, Stalin. Hitler and Stalin had pretty much the same taste in art. Uh, they both like realism, right? artistic, patriotic realism. But, it, but Italian fascism and even the French fascists are very different. They're like very much into artistic innovation. Um, and... Uh, uh, although the fascists stress, you know, maternity, having mothers, uh, you have a lot of very independent feminists who are attracted to Italian fascism. Uh, so um, uh, they don't seem to be particularly concerned about artistic deck or, or, or modern art as being degenerate art or anything like that. Um, you get more of that in the case of the, of the German Nazis. <clears throat> 
there are two things actually going back a little bit in the conversation. When you say, you know, limiting the franchise uh, for voting and things like that, I suspect that a large swath of uh, uh, young Americans and older, even older Americans would consider that fascist. Mm-hmm. Would you be able to to speak to that as far as limiting, you know, the power of government or limiting the franchise? Does that automatically mean that a nation is fascist or is there uh, is there more space for discussion and debate? First of all, it's not fascist at all, since the Italian fascists were for everybody voting and openly in favor of the government. <laughs> so they did not favor restrictions. <laughs> That's a total misconception. However, most constitutional republics and liberal monarchies have always had restrictions. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, the French Revolution introduces restrictions on voting between active and passive citizens. Uh, John Stuart Mill favors restricted suffrage, and he was a feminist and social democrat in the 19th century. What I'm saying. Uh, is that there are certain minimal qualifications that people that we should have for voting, like residence qualifications, uh, paying money, not being on welfare. That's one of John Stuart Mill's uh, uh, disabilities, for, uh, voting disabilities. <clears throat> um, there are many things we can do. to. I mean, they'll they all be called fascist, obviously. Uh, and you can't go back. You can only go forward, you know, the, the, in, in, the, in, in this sort of e- uh, race toward an egalitarian future. So now we have to let, you know, illegals vote and let everybody come into the country, felons in prison vote. You can never go back. You know, so I'm not saying we can do this. I think, unfortunately, the opportunity was lost. But I think effort should have been made to restrict the franchise. Um, So we would not be facing the situation that we are now, that in the name of equality, you know, everybody gets, and, and, you know, you listen to some Fox News, well, they should, you know, all these people, but not the ones who are coming in or, you know, not the illegals yet, or maybe the felons. So not, well, I mean, it's irreversible process once you go in this direction. Um, what, what, one of the, uh, the battles I remember in Madison, Wisconsin, when I lived, you know, near, near Madison, <clears throat> was should we let students who do not have residence qualifications vote? And I think they finally gave them the vote. And I think that was disastrous. The first act that they did was vote for a Marxist mayor uh, from Brooklyn or something like that. I remember Um, you have to restrict the franchise if you want a workable Republican form of government. Fascinating and uh, no doubt very polarizing, but very fascinating. Uh, Quick question then actually switching over to, to France and monarchy. Uh, Tyler asks, uh, can the man- monarchist action Francais be considered a fascist movement or a forerunner of fascism? That is one of the great historical questions for all historians of fascism. Where do you put the Action Francaise? And Charles Maurras, who is the head. I, I think they're a fascinating group, by the way. Um, <clears throat> there's a very good English biography by Eugen Weber on Action Francaise. Um, but I've read like all the relevant literature in French and Italian and other languages. And Maras is a brilliant stylist. Uh, I, I love German literature and philosophy, and he hated everything German because he was a you know, French nationalist. And Germans were the enemy. But I, I do like reading Maras. Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a question. We know that the German Nazis were heavily influenced by um, – by the French nationalist right of the 1870s, which was very strongly anti-German, fanatically anti-German. The Germans took away Alsace-Lorraine in the Franco-Prussian War, and they hate everything German. Um, but the German Nazis are sort of impressed by them. Um, and then there's the, then you have uh, Zev Sternhell, the Israeli historian, who wrote on the French, uh, the Oxygen Francaise and other French nationalist movements as the forerunners of, uh, of all forms of fascism in the interwar period. My own view is it doesn't quite work. I, I hold the view uh, that the Action Francaise is not a fascist movement. Um, it is sort of a, it's a monarchist movement, um, which combines with extreme French nationalism. Um, but it is clearly not a fascist movement. 
and the uh, uh, it is you know it, it basically favors a, a monarchy, um, and it is not opposed to a constitutional government uh, as long as the monarchy sort of restores what they see as you know restores French unity. Uh, so I, I do not think I do not think Maras is a uh, is a fascist. He also, I see no evidence that he was a Nazi collaborator. He was tried after World War II and, you know, given a life sentence as a Nazi collaborator. He was not. I see no evidence, whatever. Uh, he was just an unpopular man because the communists hated him. Um, and he was a very controversial figure. But uh, I lean toward the side that um, Axiom Fell says is a conservative nationalist movement, but definitely not a fascist <clears throat> Fascinating. The uh, Mike has a a follow up question actually to that. Then uh, Marina Le Pen will she have a place in uh, French nationalism? Will <clears throat> moving forward? Yeah. Uh, does she or her uh, Marichal, who's her niece, does she have a, a place? The answer is yes, but I don't think they will ever be led into the government unless some profound changes happen. I don't think they're fascist. I think they're sort of conservative nationalist. Uh, and they're probably a party favored by the more conservative goalists, the followers of De Gaulle. <clears throat> um, it'd, be very, it'd be very nice if they let them into the government, but they won't. But one of the problems you have uh, in most of the, go the governments of Europe typically are woke capitalist governments. They're socially leftist multicultural, but also very, very pro cap, very, very pro corporate capitalist. Um, and they see the, uh, uh, the, the Front National, which is now called the Rassemblement National as a, uh, uh, as an anti corporate capitalist, anti globalist party, which it is. Um, and therefore they, they try to keep it out and its counterparts and other, the, it's sort of the populist right in every European, just about in every Europe, continental European part, uh, country has been kept out of power. So I don't see uh, either Marie or now her niece, Marichal, you know, entering a government. <clears throat> the, I guess then on that note too, would you be able to, uh, really, is there a distinction between a nationalist government or nationalism and fascism? Uh, quite often in American politics, anything uh, that strikes of nationalism is quickly labeled fascist as well. Uh, can you parse some of that for us? Yeah, um, this is one of the distinctions Stanley Payne makes in his books on fascism, <clears throat> that you can be a nationalist uh, party. Uh, you can also be an authoritarian party. I mean, someone like Franco is definitely he's authoritarian, he's a nationalist, he's not a fascist. Um, he's not a revolutionary nationalist, although he appeals to some of these symbols in the 1930s because he, he's allied to the Falange, and, <clears throat> which is a fascist uh, group, but he sort of keeps, keeps them out of power at the same time. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, they're, they're a, De Gaulle is a French nationalist, he's not a fascist. <clears throat> Um, so we're looking for people who favor revolutionary change within a nationalist framework, <clears throat> which is what the, the Italian fascists claim to be. Uh, de, Gaulle is, de Gaulle is not doing this. I think De Gaulle may be almost a kind of transitional figure now that I think of this, <clears throat> because um, he is somebody who comes out of the Action Francaise. His family were monarchists or Catholic monarchists. Um, and then he, he's a French nationalist. <clears throat> Um, but he really doesn't do very much to change the economic structure uh, of the country. Yeah, he does uh, take very strong, he's very uh, obstinate about keeping Muslims out of France. This is one of the, he does talk, you know, he gives Algeria its independence, he doesn't want to come to France. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I, I, I really, he's not a fascist. Uh, he is, he is a, a conservative and a nationalist. Uh, so I, I think fascism is a very uh, particular movement. It's a specific movement. Uh, which is both nationalist and revolutionary, <clears throat> and is characteristic, you know, of interwar European politics. Uh, there's uh, usually some debate and uh, question here coming in would be when we look at China as it is today, while mm -hmm. it's the communists uh, uses the label communism, 
they're now allowing for private property and things of this nature. Would China be more of a a model of sort of uh, contemporary fascism more so than communism, or uh, is it something else? Well, I, I think about if I had to classify China, it looks more like a fascist than a communist country, right? I mean, you have uh, a highly centralized leadership, ultranationalism. Economic policies are advanced to uh, promote national well-being. There also, I think, are appeals to the Chinese past, the struggle against Western imperialists, you know. uh, By the way, Italian fascism and many of the are very anti-imperialist, you know, because they identify imperialism with the plutocratic nations, England and the United States, particularly England. So... uh, you know, Mussolini was always attacking the plutocrats. <laughs> that was a fascist refrain. <clears throat> and uh, there is an historian, um, uh, Gregor, um, <clears throat> uh, James Gregor, who writes books on the relationship between third world nationalism and Italian fascism. Uh, and, and, and there really is a sort of a crossover that you can see, although I think uh, I think he may exaggerate it. <clears throat> but I, if I had to put China in some camp, I think it may be slightly closer to the fascist camp than it is to the communism. I, I, they're always attacking it on Fox News as those communists, and they really don't look much like communists to me. I mean, they—it's uh, not—it's it's, it's a pretty disagreeable regime. But you know, I don't—they have a—they na- don't see nationalization of the means of production. They don't have collective—I don't think they have collectivized agriculture anymore. <clears throat> um, all you can see are some statues of Mao. So I—I I, I think they really have moved to a. We might describe it as a as an ultra nationalist collectivist or organized capital. I think the word is organized capitalist model. Um, the, word, the word organized capitalist was sometimes used to describe the fascists because it's capitalism, but it's sort of organized, you know, from the top as a kind of a kind of corporate enterprise. <clears throat> That's fascinating. As a follow up to that, then the <clears throat> given China's a rising power and seems to be using organized capitalism uh, to grow. I mean, when you look at pictures of different Chinese cities from, you know, the early 1980s or even sometimes the early 1990s and compare them to what they have now, it's rather incredible. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of people say there's a lot of shoddy concrete in there and you might not want to trust it all, but still, it is impressive what has happened. So, in uh, with global capital slushing around and seeking any opportunity for growth, is that likely to be more of a model for a lot of uh, countries out there? Is to pursue organized capitalism, you know, uh, or is and or is there hope of uh, you know more pursuits for a free republic, uh, you know, something along the lines of you know that Henry Clay with the tariff system and things like that. No, I, I don't think this is a, China is American in the 1840s. 1840, <laughs> <laughs> One thing, you have a, over a billion and a half people there. What did we have, like, you know, 30, 40 million people or something <laughs> spread over an entire continent? Uh, <clears throat> I, I really don't see the United States, uh, China developing uh, into the republic that we aren't any longer. <laughs> you know? I'd like to return to it. <laughs> uh, so. This, 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 this is not going to happen in China. But there, there, there was a, uh, an article I wrote on this subject, you know, is, is authoritarian capitalism <clears throat> the future of the world? And I wrote this for the American conservative about 10 years ago. Um, and I pointed out that you know, China, Singapore, other countries do have these authoritarian organized capitalist models. <clears throat> and they do work in Asia. You know, I mean, we, we see them we see them working there. Um, I don't, I'm not sure Western countries are going to move, you know, in the same direction. Uh, we're going to move toward, you know, cor- global corporate capitalism combined with anarcho tyranny or something like that. But, uh, we're not going to move in the same, but in Asia, this model does work. Another country where you see it perhaps working, not quite so successfully is, is Russia, right? I mean, obviously Putin is an authoritarian leader, <clears throat> um, Although he's not the fascist that he's called, you know, by the Democratic Party and the neoconservative press, but he is an authoritarian and he's a nationalist, he's an authoritarian nationalist. 
Uh, but I'm not quite sure how well he's doing with organized capitalism. Right. I mean, they're, they're, I, I don't know whether the economy has grown very much under him. Fascinating. Well, we are uh, somewhat actually close to wrapping up here with a few minutes left. Uh, so for, you know, for, for the very basic question that we ask, what is uh, a fascist or, you know, what is fascism? It seems to me, would it be correct for those watching to see fascism as a form of authoritarianism but one in which the state and the people are organized under sort of nationalist economic goals, uh, still allowing for private property, still allowing for mm -hmm. discourse amongst the people. Uh, is that accurate? Yeah, you also have typically in fascist um, models or fascist parties, emphasis on a leader like Il Duce in Italy, Mussolini, so that every fascist movement has a duce. And of course, uh, the German, you know, the uh, Hitler as the uh, de Führer is also a form of this, right? He takes that over uh, from Italian fascism because the, the German Nazis borrow selectively from both Italian fascism and Stalin's government, probably more from Stalin. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, th there, are th there is that feature as well. Um, uh, one of the things missing from China, there's no real appeal to the national past there, right? I mean, you have that with Putin's Russia, uh, that, you know, Russia is a great Orthodox Christian country going back a thousand years and so forth. Uh, China seems to be all about change. This is Devin Foley with the Charlemagne Institute and Chronicles Magazine. I'd like to apologize. Our internet went down, Comcast and unfortunately cut off the last bit of our presentation. So share it far and wide if you appreciated it and got a lot out of it. We will again be doing this uh, back channel on a weekly basis. And furthermore, if you like learning from Dr. Paul Gottfried, which is fantastic and brilliant, do consider subscribing to Chronicles Magazine. Just go to chroniclesmagazine.org, click subscribe, and $5 a month. You get Chronicles Magazine, and uh, Dr. Gottfried is the editor-in-chief of the magazine, and it is simply fantastic. So if you like intellectual takeout, but you want to go deeper, definitely subscribe to Chronicles Magazine. And otherwise, look for an email or a notice from us on social media. Uh, we'll be back in action next week. Thank you very much, and uh, hope you can join us again.